You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Health Innovators. On today's episode, we are flipping the script again with our original OG crew, our panel discussion with Jeff Carlisle, uh, Howard Rosen, and Brent Wright. This is our second episode, and we're going to do more, so please subscribe and tune in for this incredible discussion that we're going to have. Today's topic is going to be the growth drivers, the restraints, and the trends around healthcare consumerism, a topic that I think is very dear to all of us. Um, So let's just jump into the conversation and um, answer the first question of what are the growth drivers you think that are really um, the force behind healthcare consumerism that we're seeing accelerated today? Well, certainly uh, there isn't a trend unless there's a problem. Right, so we got to identify what is the what is the problem, and I think that patients don't feel rightly that they're getting uh, the right care at the right value, and mm-hmm. um, so I think that that drives them to look for something else. And I don't know that healthcare consumerism is really growing all that uh, quickly. I, I wouldn't assume it just because it's easy to say rapidly growing healthcare consumerism. I'm not. I'm not sure that it's true, uh, so I'd like to I'd like to hear a little bit more about that as to whether or not we really think it is growing, uh, but I think it's growing out of a dissatisfaction with the status quo. It, it, yeah, that's interesting, Jeff. In terms of it's a good it, it's a good response because the consumerism has always been there. Part of the issue is the tools to do it. You've got that crowd that's been the worried well that forever want to know more and more and more have pieces of information. And you have those that are having a chronic a condition that they want information on. So I think there's been a pent up demand that we're still going through, even with COVID, all the tools that we're still working through and trying to make sense of the tools that do exist and what are providing value and not providing value. And it's, it's so the, the problem was you know, they do want more information. How do you get that more information? Now they're starting to get it, but what does it mean? Because part of it is an overload of information as well. And an overload is almost as bad as no information because there's lots of bad information in there. And so I think that causes dissatisfaction. So I think statistically, I think you're right. I think, you know, you're seeing a lot of mixed signals as to the uptake and not uptake of telehealth and variety of solutions. But part of that, I think, is this dissatisfaction of what that experience is, because this is not the kind of information I wanted or was expected. Has COVID been uh, a a pivotal element to this? No no question, in part because the the consumers have wanted to have these kind of relationships. All due respect to the wonderful providers and payers out there, they've been the ones who've been reluctant to provide it. Um, So it's been a push and now became a pull uh, just because the economics and the situation created it. So sometimes it comes, be careful what you ask for because <laughs> you get it. Now it's like, okay, now do we do, what do we do? On right, do you agree COVID, COVID's been a game changer in, uh, in consumerism? Well, I, I think COVID has been a game changer in how we look at consumerism. And I would most specifically call out the example of telehealth. Telehealth had been around for decades and the adoption had been lackluster. You know, you bring COVID into the mix and then you start looking at what I would say would be the entry into digitization of healthcare. I mean, everyone in more of a corporate sector is looking at digital and looking at digital channels. And this was being looked at heavily, you know, five years ago. Uh, Healthcare, to me, when you unpack this consumerism, is healthcare has a hard time of looking at itself as consumerism. Those who seek to innovate, looking around the edges, I think, understand healthcare needs to be based on consumerism. However, if you look at healthcare systems and the way healthcare systems think, they're still very parental. They're, they're still very, you know, mm-hmm. monopolistic in their thinking when it comes to the patient. Just look at records, how records are managed. But I'm, I'm going to stop there and not go into the records discussion because that could easily take up its whole, whole time. But I, I'm going to mention here a restraint that I think when you talk about consumerism is, yes, we all see consumerism coming. We see the need for digital. We see the need for innovation. But when you look at patients themselves, oftentimes the patients with the highest health burden may not be poised to avail themselves of digital, of consumerism techniques, of the apps, application of healthcare. 
and these new tools that people are that that one side of the healthcare spectrum is wanted to drive towards in the more entrenched incumbent healthcare system is not able to mitigate because they're still being paid on an old model. Definitely. Um, I, you know, I, I completely agree. It, it, it almost creates um, some inequities. So it's good that we're making some progress. We have some restraints that are holding us back um, as well. And then it also can potentially create some new challenges for us to deal with or it exacerbate some of the challenges that we've been dealing with, with inequity in healthcare. Exactly. And, and Brent, uh, you wanted, ahead, wanted to not mention electronic medical records because that would take up the whole show. And in fact, it would take up many shows. Uh, but I think it's uh, central. Uh, the you know, ownership and quality and where is the locus of the medical record is an absolutely essential uh, part of consumerism. Absolutely. And, it, and it's an important part because ownership, it is who's, whose data is this really and becomes absolute core to it. And but tied to it is something, Brent, you've said as well, is the business model and the payment model, and the revenue models, because ultimately, yes, it's healthcare, but it's a business. So, and it's, it's the revenue model tends to drive a lot of how the business and what the interactions are and how that's going to work and affects directly the ownership of the data. It is what, who owns it? What's done with it? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that what you guys are saying as far as, you know, the consumerism has always been there, the demand. And, and we just haven't been servicing those patients well. We haven't been delivering for a really long time. And I think what COVID did is it forced the hand of a lot of providers to be able to deliver that, um, kind of debunking a lot of the uh, myths that they had in their own mind about what could and couldn't be done. You know, I mean, I think that if we didn't have COVID, we would still be talking about healthcare consumerism without any inching of pro progress for another decade, at least. <laughs> so, oh, 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 we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We, you know, might work for those people, but we can't do it over here. Who was the stumbling block, though? Do you, was it really the, you don't think it was the patients? Do you think it was the providers or was it the payers? I think it was much, much more the, the payers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, many, you know, the many providers who, wanted to do things in a more efficient way, but uh, they didn't get paid for it. So. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I've interviewed a number of physicians over the years and had conversations with them. And they said, absolutely. Like, I don't have to see those patients face to face for every single visit. There's a couple of visits that we could do through digital means, but I don't get compensated um, the same uh, or at all for that. And, and so, that you know, that can't be part of my business model. <laughs> Yeah. Well, absolutely. I think that's a key, a key piece to that. And the other side is, is just is the technology is our inherent assumptions as to what technologies certain populations could or could not accept. Mm -hmm. And which, uh, you know, in terms of we were, frankly, we were pleasantly surprised in terms of work we've worked with CMS populations of frankly, how sophisticated the solutions they can use, like not necessarily using large bandwidth, but in terms of what those populations are capable of, where clients are going, well, they couldn't do this. And it turned out they could and actually to great effect. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of assumptions that have been working as opposed to anyone asking anybody in, in many cases. Yeah. So Brent, what are some of the things, especially because of your role, you know, as the uh, associate dean for rural health innovation, right? Um, what What is your perspective on how do we, how do we advance consumerism um, with also being mindful of some of the social de determinants and some of the inequities there? I, I think if you're going to advance consumerism, I think, you know, how people adopt technology has to be a thought there and, and, and meeting them where they are. You know, it, I was in an hour long phone call yesterday and we were talking about apps and we were talking about, you know, the adoption of apps and whether or not people had the pathway or the technology even to start in that app process. And I think that uh, I think that we have to look at when we talk about adoption uh, in, in, in high need populations in your rural area. I have a lot of experience. I've grown up and I practice and my career is dedicated to to rural populations. But, you know, I would encourage people to say not just rural, but disadvantaged or disparate yes. or, yeah. or low resource population. And you can be a low resource population in a metropolitan area. So I think that when you start thinking about innovation and consumerism, you, you need to think maybe about 
least common denominators or, or pathways or adoption or efficiencies and how you do the workflow. I, I've been a victim as a physician of so many bad workflows through technology that, that have been brought in and people say, oh, this is a great technology. It does something great, but it's going to cost you a half an hour to an hour extra a day, or it's going to cost your staff more time. People don't understand how 30 seconds, you know, adds up when you have to do that 30 seconds, extra 30 seconds, 20 times a day, 30 times a day, 40 times a day. There's a lot of administrative burden there. Patients have, have stress in their lives. And I think that's something that people are going to have to uh, understand, whether it's a social determinant evaluation, whether it's a mental health evaluation, and how we meet those patients where we are. We're really the, the, the drive to me in all of this is precision. Uh, and I'm not ca- talking about precision genomics, but I, I think about precision education based on the individual patient. The data is so, the data pools are so rich now, but in healthcare, we're just not driving them toward the individual patient's benefit. It's, it's interesting you use 30 seconds because that's what the exact, sorry, sorry, Jeff. No, that's what you were just saying. That's what you said. There's too much, uh, too much information, but uh, I would say, Maybe more specifically, there's too much data and not enough information. But uh, I, 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 actually, I, I accept that qualification. No, that's uh, absolutely correct. But just Brent, your point of 30 seconds is interesting because when we provide solutions, we actually use the 30 second rule. Where if it's going to take the clinicians or the providers 30 seconds more out of their day, we failed what we're trying to do because our objective is to save time for the patients, but also the ecosystem and for the clinicians as well. And we literally, that is a, a measure that we use because you can't, because you said you guys are already working 30 hours a day, you, you know, 30 seconds is right. dramatic in that regard. Right. I, I think it gets into the relativity of healthcare time. You know, when you, when someone goes to an ER or a hospital, they wait four to six hours. It seems like forever for the people who are doing the work. It seems like that four to six hours has gone by extremely fast. <laughs> And I try to talk to people who are, who are looking at technology solutions I, when they're trying to design around the physician workflow. I've explained to them the clinical minute. And, you know, if you're in front of someone, and if you have the clock going for 60 seconds and you can't do something, that clinical minute seems like 20 minutes. There's a magnification of time. Time is relative around clinical encounters. And you just can't, you can't add to the workflow. You have to reduce the workflow. And, and that's a challenge when you're looking at technology solutions? Well, I, I know I think that the technology solutions can give you back time that you're taking. If they're done properly, you know, it's like a Dunkin' Donuts drive-through app, you know? You say, oh, yeah. Yeah. I just reduced my, my interactions by 90%. You know, right. Ordering, paying, all that stuff. It's just, a, it's incredible. but. Uh, I think a lot of applications are done without that being top of mind. Well, that's, that's exactly the case. It's many of them are done. I got this great idea done in someone's basement um, without actually talking to the users, the end users. And that's probably the biggest failing of a lot of solutions is they go to the end user once it's finished developing, and then they try to force a solution as opposed to a solution that the end users actually need. Now, understandably, if we ask somebody what you need, many cases, all they know is what their buzzwords are. They don't know what's capable, but that's why you need, it, it's, it really is interaction between the two to sort of develop these solutions that really adjust and people understand on both sides what are needs and what the capabilities are. I've found that with truly disruptive technologies, you really can't ask people though. You have to watch them you, because if you say, you know, as you know, they, what people in 1900 wanted was a horse that ate less. They didn't want an automobile. Right. <laughs> faster, less. faster horses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and really, yeah, it's, it's really more, I guess, once you've sort of started your development process, that's when you start asking to make sure it does work. But there's no question, the inspiration won't come from asking because what people know are buzzwords. Like ages ago, when it used to be in advertising, I'd go into a meeting and I'd talk to the clients and I didn't know maybe not much about the client or anything else, but the one thing I did know is when I asked them what they wanted, that was the last thing they needed. (laughs) (laughs) Because they knew the buzzword, but didn't really know, understand what the, what really are, what would help them. 
Well, and I think that there's a science and an art to this whole customer just customer discovery process too, that we're talking about, because it's really easy to, um, you know, kind of humor your board or your advisors or your, you know, the rest of your leadership team of doing discovery, um, only just to kind of intentionally validate the beliefs that you already had when you went into it, especially if you're already so either financially or emotionally invested in that particular solution or pathway. Um, And so I think it takes a lot of humility leaving our egos at the door to really be able to say that I'm not the one, my opinion really doesn't matter nearly as much as our customers, our target customers. And in that really the data, that customer data rules out our opinion. And I don't see that enough. Yes. You're saying logic and rationality don't necessarily play a role. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And too many technology solutions that are looking for a problem instead of starting off with the problem and then figuring out the solution. And, yeah. And, and Roxy, Jeff touched. So go ahead. Brent. Oh, and Roxy, that's where I get a lot of calls from startup companies who they're, they're sort of playing themselves out. I can tell within five to 10 minutes that the, that the product or the service is really not there, but they come to the rural area thinking, you know, all oh, these poor souls in the rural areas, you know, uh, you know, surely if there's some bit of, if I say technology and, and tell them, let's come work with them, they'll, they'll take us up on this offer. <laughs> I, I tell people all the time, I said, if you want to make something work, come to a rural area. I said, if you can make it work in a rural area, you're not going to have a problem going to bigger cities, more technology, you know, driven areas and, and having that work, you know, where you have a density of talent, make it work in a rural area. I say, start with us because, we'll tell you how to save money. I mean, that's being frugal, I think, and, and rural go so well together. We'll, we're always going to look for a low cost solution to get what we want. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. That's for all the listeners. Take heed to that. <laughs> <laughs> Another economic part is obviously we touched on uh, the compensation. If you, if you really want to support uh, telehealth, then you've got to pay for it, right? Uh, <laughs> But the other aspect of that is the transparency of healthcare costs. And uh, that's a, a, a very big deal to be able to, uh, and, I, and there are quite a few trends in that direction, uh, good legislation, there's, uh, there's some stuff happening in that direction to allow for genuine healthcare transparency. It's not easy though, because uh, the complexity, you know, we went from ICD-9 to ICD-10 with a, without any real thought as to what would that do, you know, for improved quality or improved price transparency. And it, it just really made things much more difficult to understand because uh, the categorization now was so complex, it needed a computer. And so it, it, the whole tr- price transparency is very important, but it's not very straightforward. So let's talk about that. What role is the FDA playing in consumerization and how are they either moving us along or hindering us? Well, I I think the FDA uh, in its current form may cause more harm than good because the emphasis is all on pre-market approval. You know, what happens in a highly controlled clinical study with a highly uh, controlled cohort and and then once it's done, it's the wild, wild west. You can do anything you want. It, if you flip that around and said, we're just going to provide transparency to users to say, hey, this new device you're using, it's been used 42,000 times and there are 6% reports on complications. Or it's been used 12 times and there are six reports on complications. Or it's been used 42 million times and there are six reports on complications. If you could give improved post-market surveillance and relax the, I think, artificial uh, barriers set up in pre-market approval, maybe a drug wouldn't cost a billion dollars, right? We accept that it does. Oh, it cost a, a billion dollars. Well, if you follow the clinical trials for a drug, you understand why it cost a billion, because nothing in it makes sense. It just, it's uh so I think FDA, if they shifted more to a post-market surveillance model, would go a long way to support consumerism. That's an excellent point. And quite on, you know, back you know to the C word, COVID. 
I think we saw a perfect example of the vaccines because that was an example of where you had accelerated FDA approvals, regardless, you know, right or wrong. Um, and it's all been nothing but post-market surveillance that the entire world has been watching, which you've never really had in any extent like that before. And so when you're seeing, oh, you're getting this issue with that medication or this issue that, that's post-market surveillance that you don't have not seen in other kind of medications. So to your point, Jeff, I think it's an excellent, and it's always been something we've been talking about is a need that should, they should be doing. Um, hopefully, this is actually an example of why you need to have that and the value proposition associated with it. Though, Brent, you probably have much more visibility than I do in anything like that. No, I, I agree with both of these comments, and I, I wasn't going to give too much of a response other than I think the FDA needs to add another A, and it echoes the word that Jeff said, which was advice. And I, I wrote down notes prior to this saying it needs to be advisory. You know, you've got administration, but you really need advisory. You know, patients, I think, are looking for advice. They are looking for that. You no, know, don't just administrate, but advise. I love and, it. And, <laughs> and I, so that, that's really what, I think that's really what we're looking for because we get that disconnect and, and it gets, you, you need consumerism because consumerism, consumers don't have that direction, that guidance, that navigation that they need. So maybe that I don't want to, I don't want to see another federal panel created by any means, but, you know, just think about that end user and how it affects their life. I mean, pa- there are a lot of confused patients out there, a lot of confused families uh, when you get into this realm. And we oftentimes, when we talk about big, big areas, technology and innovation, and other catch terms, we forget about those, you know, people in the room and those people in the hallways that are just struggling. You know, we can't ever forget those individuals. Yeah. Hey, it's Dr. Roxy here with a quick break from the conversation. Are you trying to figure out what moves you need to make to survive and thrive in the new COVID economy? I want every health innovator to find their most viable and profitable pivot strategy, which is why I created the COVID Proof Your Business Pivot Kit. The Pivot Kit is a step-by-step framework that helps you find your best pivot strategy. It walks you through six categories you need to examine for a 360-degree view of your business. I call them the six critical pivot lenses. As you make your way through this comprehensive kit, you'll be armed with the tools, tips, and strategies you need to make sure you can pivot with speed without missing out on critical details and opportunities. Learn more at legacy-dna.com backslash kit. Well, Brent, you got, you've got people now struggling, obviously struggling with the idea of getting or not getting a vaccination for COVID. And at this moment in time, the FDA, they haven't made up their mind yet, right? It hasn't been cleared other than for emergency use. Right. And so what, it, how, how are you expecting someone to make a determination with their own body and their own money and own risk. Uh, if, if the agency that's supposed to do that hasn't made the, that determination yet, it, it can be very confusing, I think. Uh, it, it's yeah, confusing. I, it, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, it, it is. And I think when you talk about hesitancy, that's one of the top three that I always hear, you know, it's still emergency use. It's, you know, EUA and, the f- and the other issue is I'm just going to throw the CDC in there as well. I mean, people are looking at these bodies to provide guidance. I mean, that's what they're there for, to provide guidance, advice, direction. And, and when they when they hesitate at all, it, it causes people to pause. And, and we've got a real, real issue out here and people trying to make scientific decisions when they don't have a scientific background. And any hesitancy on, on these venerable bodies, I you know, in the last six weeks, I've heard, had more people say, I just don't trust them anymore. When you lose trust, you, you don't get that back quickly. Right. And the, and the consumerism, you get the patients in this regard are making their own, the consumers are making their decisions. You know, right. it's, they're fully empowered, rightly or wrongly, have to go, okay, I've got to go through all this information, all these news reports, all these online reports, because the, the source of information, some are better than others. Uh, After Google again, right? Yeah, and it, it's extremely <laughs> difficult. And even when the authorities change their minds, you, you mentioned earlier, Jeff, that becomes even more confusing. When today something is okay, tomorrow it isn't. Then the third day, well, a mix of the two works. And how so yesterday, any person, go ahead. 
Yeah, yesterday I see a headline, you know, it says uh, 85% of the new cases uh, of COVID are the Delta variant. And it was written in kind of a breathless tone, right? Of it, wow, 85%. Well, I'm thinking, okay, but what's the right number? I mean, is 85 a bad number or a good number? I don't know. I mean, I, I could make an argument that, gee, 85 is not good. It should be 92 or <laughs> 17. I mean, who knows, right? But the, the idea that you throw a big number out and, and people are supposed to properly interpret it, I don't know how to interpret that number. I, I, could, I could make an epidemiological or mathematical argument that it should be higher or lower. I don't, I don't know which, which way to go on it, but it's not a headline. Be a footnote at best. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, as we kind of just go back to this idea of, um, you know, having COVID test us on what we really think is possible and what we can't do. And we're talking about the FDA and being able to accelerate um, the approval process. And, you know, this is kind of post-data surveillance. Do you guys think that we're going to see more of this? Is it kind of like telehealth where it's kind of opened the door and now, oh my gosh, now we're going to really reinvent this process? And is it going to take a while or are we going to be inching along? And what's going to affect that or influence it? Well, I think I think it's the number of factors. One is, again, just in terms of the, the COVID, it's not like on Thursday they said we better find a COVID vaccine. You know, they've been working on the, the SARS vaccine for a long time. So yeah. it's been in the background sitting, but there's no funding <laughs> for it. What happened was there was accelerated funding, so they're able to speed up that process. Now, no question in terms of the phase, the phase trials were accelerated. Um, and I think there's some good learnings out of that in a number of areas, which are going to be helpful to accelerate the process going forward. But it's not like they went from zero to, you know, in zero to solution that quickly. It's been in the, it's been sitting in the back rooms for ages in development, one form Mm -hmm. or another. Yeah. Just like telehealth, right. Been sitting in the background for a long time. (laughs) Exactly. And then you got nice stress test by having millions of people or tens of hundreds of millions of people using, they go, okay, this is working. This is not. So it's creating that tweaking. But yeah, the system, but now it's out there. So who's doing it well? What are some examples of companies that are really, you know, um, not just having patient centric um, plastered on their website or on their walls? Um, who's, who's the companies out there, the brands that are really empowering patients in, um, in, a, in a meaningful way? Boy, that's a, that's a really tough question. I think we're still figuring it out. Like yeah. you've you've got because I I don't think we want to confuse uptake with successful outcomes. Because mm-hmm. I think it, we're still in that learning process. Because I think if you look at all the statistics, there is a peaks and valleys on how that's going as everyone's sort of learning how to make it work. I think there's I, a lot I, of. I, uh, I have ahead, one, it's a very good question, and, and, but I have one general area that I think has gone real well, and that is uh, uh, image uh, transfers, that uh, we've been able to take all your scans, your MRI, ultrasound, and all of that, and democratize it. I mean, you've now got a primary care physician who can playfully, educatedly, uh, ed- uh, intelligently uh, look through scans seconds after they've been done. And that, that to me has pushed very, very high technology down to the primary care level and patients, right. Can go home with their own ultrasound and MRIs and uh, they may not know what to do with it, but I think that's a big area of empowerment, the general field of image uh, management. Mm-hmm. But that's something, again, as a technology that existed has just got accelerated by pushing it down to everybody as opposed to, and, and, and but to your point, but it's the comfort factor of being able to use it now and that primary physician feeling more comfortable of having that kind of speed and having the tools available to them to do that. Well, there are technology issues too, bandwidth, you know, <clears throat> yeah. to do things that were Which goes to some of the rural, goes against some of the rural issues as well in terms of the, the bandwidth that exists. You know, Roxy, I'm going to dive into that question. You asked who, and I'm going to take a very broad look and maybe how I prefaced my statement earlier. 
I'm going to name four companies. I'm going to name Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Walmart. And because when you talk about consumerism in healthcare and how that moves in healthcare, I think you have to understand the companies that understand the consumer well. And I think you need to understand where technology and where age demographics are, are going to drive healthcare going forward. And rather than call out specific health systems, because I don't know infinitely, you know, throughout the United States, what programs are good. And I'm sure there's some good programs, but if you look at the scale needed to really influence healthcare and influence consumerism, those four companies come to mind because people are going to do best with their healthcare in ways that they are influenced. And I think these companies stand, uh, stand very tall in their ability to influence those who are their stakeholders and their, those who are their consumers. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that there are probably many tools out there that could empower patients, could put more of that decision making and control in their hands, but I don't think it's it's distributed or disseminated in the right way. It's, it, it's, it's not been commercialized successfully um, in order to really get into those hands of the patients that need them um, or all of the patient's hands. So there's this disconnect between, oh, well, I created an app that will do this, but no one's logging into my app. No one's setting up an account, right? It's just cobwebs and crickets over there um, where then you've got these really, uh, you know, these big tech companies, these big brands uh, that have really focused on consumerism. And that is a key part of their business strategy. Um, and, and I think that that's also one of those drivers that's happening as we go back to that is that as we use those brands and, and Amazon is the one that just immediately comes to mind because I think it's so pervasive is that our expectation is for all of our digital experiences to be like an Amazon experience. And I think that's driving some of that consumerism, even though you've got the push pull with the ecosystem that's kind of resistant to it. You're right. The bar has been elevated by all those applications for sure. Yeah. 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 And, and bringing the whole consumerism element into it, to your point, Brent, they really are the big mm -hmm. drivers behind that all. And with Amazon to have Samuel L. Jackson on Alexa to remind you to take your pills, really what more of a driver do you need than that? It's just genius, <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, so let's just talk about that too, as we kind of start to wrap up here, you know, how do we think the four big tech companies, um, you know, Alphabet, AKA Google, right? Um, Amazon, uh, Amazon, Apple, and uh, Microsoft, how are they influencing healthcare or are they? You know, besides this Amazon effect, or, or you know, do we have any um, thoughts around them actually getting more and more entrenched in healthcare? Well, oh, I think there's no question they get more entrenched in a variety of ways, but in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. As you said, we talked about earlier, Google's Dr. Google. So there's an information pathway there. Mm -hmm. With Apple, there's no question they want to create a conduit in terms of through some of the various apps in terms of dissemination of information, you know, images or whatever the case may yeah. be through the various pieces. Amazon is a delivery mechanism in many cases, um, you know, through prescriptions that they're doing now. And they, is that they all have their different niches and IBM, I think is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Like obviously AWS, you've got some pieces, but I think IBM has other pieces. So I think they're all going to get involved. I think you're going to see, they're going to create their own niche areas um, because, you know, who knew healthcare was so complicated. I think they're all taking different, you know, you can't take it all on. So you got to take on the different elements. And I think we're going to start seeing over the next year or so more clearly what elements they want to take over or try to take or take dominance in. Yeah. And I definitely think that Amazon and Google are going head to head when you look at the stats uh, around voice and the applications of voice in healthcare. I mean, you know, for the first time, we're starting to see voice conferences. Um, you know, even just three years ago, you had a conference and a voice conference and healthcare was kind of a small piece of it. Now you're seeing these standalone voice conferences and in the big tech companies, you know, are the ones that are absolutely facilitating that, right? <clears throat> I think the limitation is certainly not, it's certainly not technology. The limit, limitation is how do the appropriate levels of money get transferred? So in consumerism, if you had 
uh, financial skin in the game. And uh, it mattered how much you spent, but you could allocate your money to, towards a service that helped you manage your medical records and helped you do that. Um, that would drive a lot of the uh, adoption. But right now it's just, it's still all too confusing, right? Mm -hmm. Healthcare insurance isn't really insurance. It's economic redistribution with a big layer that sits between you and your doctor, right? To me, my biggest view of my insurance company is a uh, wall in between myself and my physician. And <clears throat> they're, they're kind of in the way. Uh, yeah. But if they really were a true insurance company mm -hmm. to cover your expenses, but you had skin in the game, I think that would direct money to the right service at Amazon or Google or XYZ. So as we wrap up here, uh, the last question that I have for the OG group here is, you know, what is it as we're all patients, right? in some form or fashion, <laughs> um, what do we need to do as consumers? Is the, or is there anything that we can do to help move us? And then as we're thinking about our audience for the show and other health innovators and you know people that are part of this ecosystem, what's, what is the guidance? What do we need to do to actually change this and to really make a difference? As an employer, I would say offering uh, you know, high deductible, true insurance, uh, skin in the game for the employees as an, an employer offering those kinds of uh, financially uh, incentivize or incentives to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of, I apologize for the background noise if you, if you hear any of it, but to me it's, it's, and we sort of touched on earlier in terms of for both the patient, the provider, the entire ecosystem is with all these tools and, you know, you've got all this data is really make sure what you're providing is actually valuable information. So mm -hmm. there's actually valuable information for the patient, valuable information for the clinician, for the provider, for the payer, because that's what you got to get through. Because at the end of the day, it's fine. It's easy to make noise and lots of data. That's not, that's not hard. The difficulty is actually getting information that's actionable and valuable to people in the system. Yeah. You know, you have to be a healthy agitator here and that if, if you're going to play and, and try to affect change in this healthcare ecosystem, you have to understand where, where the other parties are, you know, and, and you can't do anything in healthcare unless you're going to be affecting someone else's business model. And as you do that, you, you need, if you're going to be effective in get, giving advice and working as a leader, you, you need to temper that in your comments. I've seen too many people who could be effective leaders in healthcare, just scorch earth, you know, leave the room and say, I know better than anyone. And, and, and then they're useless. They're ineffective. Yeah. It's really hard uh, for the multiple players in healthcare to play well together. But that's what we're really striving for is to create those perfect multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams that's, that's there for the patient. Again, patient first. Patient first. If you lose your way, come back to the patient. They'll, they'll tell you what's wrong with them because they're sick and they're in need. But you won't win all your battles, but you have to stay in the game because, because it's too important. Yeah, definitely. So one thing that I would just add to that that comes to mind is, um, you know, co-creation, which kind of ties to our earlier conversation around customer discovery, but patient co-creation or like you said, like multi stakeholder co-creation to where I'm not just co-creating with the people that I'm, that are paying for the solution, but I'm making sure that everybody that's involved um, in this, in this uh, process gets a seat at the table and then still elevating the patient's seat at the table. So that way the patient trumps what the payer and the provider and the employer are saying as they sit there and we're kind of brainstorming what we're going to develop and, and how we're going to bring this to market and what this user experience is going to look like. Um, where most people aren't doing cu customer discovery. If we are, we aren't doing it with everyone that needs to be part of that process. So I, I think that that is going to really help move us in the right direction. Any uh, question? Yeah. So any other question, uh, any other question, uh, comments for our audience before we wrap up? 
Uh, only one good. important point, and that is if you're a patient who has gathered as much information as they can, you're always fearful of going in and, and you know, saying that you've consulted with Dr. Google because it takes very little rejection from your doctor to not want to do that again. Yeah. And so it's, it, it's, I don't know what, I don't know what the answer is. I just know that, that you're not, it's not a peer to peer conversation you're having and uh, a little bit of rejection from the, the doctor goes a long way to stopping that kind of dialogue with the patient. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good point. But, but the other hand, you, but you've got to remember, it's your health, it's your life. And so to be able to sort of say, you know, the doctor is going to push back to expect that they may be able to push back, but to push back yourself because you need this information for yourself. And if you've heard something, yep. you'd like to get feedback on that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I would say ha- encourage patients and families to always have a healthy advocate in advance. You know, not everyone can have a doctor in their family, APRN, a nurse. But you've got a friend, you've, you've got social media. My favorite calls are people who call me just to consult based on a medical workup, whether it's for them or their family, because oftentimes they find the solution or they answer their questions just by sounding them out because they know they're going to get someone who's calm, who all I'm there to do is listen, that ultimately I don't have any ownership in that because it's not my care plan. Right. But Oftentimes, people just don't feel like they have that latitude in their care environment because offices are busy, doctors are busy, but sometimes you just need to hit the pause button and talk through that. So try to have that person identified in advance. Maybe that's a development for an, for some sort of app or, or, or development <laughs> down the line. That tool. Yeah, there's, there's definitely not enough out there for caregivers and advocates. Right. That is a huge gaping hole. Well, thank that, you guys so much for show joining us. What's that, Howard? And that's a show on its own. Yes, exactly. That'll be our next topic. <laughs> Caregivers and advocates. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me today. It's been another great discussion. Until next time. Good to see you guys. Thank you. All right. Good seeing you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I know you're busy working to bring your life-changing innovation to market, and I value your time and attention. To get the latest episodes on your mobile device automatically, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thank you for listening, and I appreciate everyone who shared the show with friends and colleagues. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.